Michelle Gertie for newcomers. <laughs> We are a Zone 7 here in Prescott, Arizona. Um, we have very different growing aspects than anywhere else in the country. Um, we are, reside mile high, so we're very, very close to the sunshine, so it's very, very intense. Plus, we have no humidity whatsoever, except for during the little bit of the winter months. Um, so growing conditions, are challenging at times, um, but we're here to make it easier for you and to make it less difficult. Um, so uh, first I want to talk about the times of the year for planting. So um, our last frost date in the springtime is usually around Mother's Day. Um, so that is when your tropical tomatoes, peppers, cucumber squash, and all that is going to be planted. Um, all that warm season vegetables do not like to be in the ground under 45 degrees. Um, they just don't like it. So if you put them in early, protect them. Uh, there are some of those walls of water down in the lower house um, in the hardwoods place. Um, that will help bring that temperature up. Um, if we do have a ton of tomatoes because of all the stuff that's going on, um, I've sold more tomatoes in the last two weeks than I've ever sold in March. I don't even bring them in in March. Um, but um, because of everything, people are bringing them, in it, uh, bringing them in, they're putting them in a sunroom, in a place where there's lots of light, and, and just taking care of them until we're ready to plant. Um, our last, or first frost in the fall is usually the end of October, early November. Um, so we do have a couple of season, growing seasons here, uh, which is really nice. Um, so cool season kind of does that March through May. Um, so your cabbage, your kale, your lettuce, your radish, all that stuff kind of goes in in those early springtime uh, months. And again, your, your summertime stuff, your tomatoes, your peppers, squash, zucchini, um, all of that stuff goes in after Mother's Day. Um, or just be really careful, know that you're going to have to use a frost, cloth, a, a frost cloth. A frost cloth will actually give you four or five degrees, so uh, it's a really nice barrier if you want to get planted early. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about general planting. Um, you can plant pretty much any time of the year here. Um, because our soil does not freeze all the way down. Um, as long as you can dig a hole, you're ready to go. Uh, um, there are definitely times that are better than others, um, but um, you can plant at any time. So right now, um, getting fruit trees in um, before they have leaves on them is always a great idea. Um, getting your evergreens in either early, early spring or in late fall you'll find that they do much, much better than planting in midsummer. Um, another thing about Prescott is that um, we have um, a monsoon season. We have the windy season, which we're right in the middle of. Um, as you've probably noticed, the wind's been blowing since March. Um, so usually from March until monsoon season starts, we will get that prevailing south wind um, that just drives us all nuts. Um, after the monsoon hit, it just kind of calms down and everything's nice, except for right when the storm happens. Um, and then the rest of the fall is really, really nice. Um, so uh, the season's really nice. Um, when you're looking throughout the nursery, you kind of want to pay uh, Pay attention to the tags as far as their size and everything else range. But if you're 
you're looking for a specific plant for a specific place and it says full sun, maybe not here. So ask one of us and we can help you with that. So for instance, um, your azaleas, your rhododendrons, uh, camellias, uh, gardenias, all of those things we usually put in a full sun place in California, Oregon, uh, the East Coast, the Midwest, all of that, um, because of our, our altitude and our intense sunshine, they need some afternoon shade protection. Um, they'll just fry. Um, so be careful. We're here to help you with things like that. So if you have questions, ask. Don't rely on that tag because it's made for the countrywide, not just for here. Um, so when you go to plant, um, one of the first things we tell you to do is if you have not dug a hole in your yard, um, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> um, we either have uh, decomposed granite, we have clay, we have uh, caliche, we have rocks. Um, so there are a lot of different things, elements that we have to be careful with. Um, when you're digging, the first thing that we want to do is kind of dig a hole and, and just fill it up with water. We want to see if that you have drainage. Drainage is really important because roots, you, you'll actually suffocate a plant if you do not have drainage. And if you are quail wood, dewy, um, I think some of the um, granite dells has some clay in it. Uh, Chino uh, is a big one for clay. Um, clay will hold your moisture in. Uh, usually when we have issues with plants, it's just trying to find that sweet spot as far as watering goes. Um, Ken was hold, uh, passing out cards earlier, and on the back of those cards are our watering guide. Um, so typically when you buy a plant with us, we'll give you a planting guide that'll tell you, I bought a 15 gallon tree, we're gonna water it twice a week, 15 gallons each time you plant or you water. So you're gonna actually, that tree's gonna get 30 gallons in a week's time. That being said, if you have, are in that clay areas, you will probably not be watering that much because that clay is going to hold that moisture. Now if you're in a very porous soil and it drains really quickly, you'll probably do that twice a week. Um, you do not have to water as often as you think you do except for new plantings. Basically we want to keep that root ball nice and moist so it keeps viable and keeps growing. Um, the other thing about our ground is basically it's cracked. Um, there's no nutrients whatsoever in it. Um, our pH level is very, very high. Um, so we definitely need to amend. Every time you plant something, you want to amend the hole. Um, we use the premium mulch to plant with. So every time, and it doesn't matter what conditions you are in, we will do two-thirds natural soil because the, the, whatever we're planting needs to get used to the ground that it's going to be in. So we do two-thirds natural soil, one-third uh, the premium mulch. And our premium mulch is compost, um, so it, it's light, it, it's fluffy, and, and it's going to add some organic materials to help better drainage. It also uh, adds holding power for those that are in that granite uh, DG. Um, you can go a little bit heavier if you're really, really in the heavy clay, um, but never go more than, than a half. I would never go more than a half because you won't have a, a substantial root system ever grow. Um, when you plant, dig your hole, you always want to go twice as wide is the, bu the bucket is itself. So if I was planting this, I'd go this wide, just as deep as it is in here. Um, we want it to be even with the ground. 
Um, we don't want it to be lower so the water will run in because you'll end up uh, getting root rot and you'll kill your plant. Um, if you're going to air, we want to go up. You'd rather plant it high than, than low. Um, if you are finding a, an area that has really bad drainage, one of the things that a lot of people do around here is they'll add a berm um, or you know some sort of a raised bed to give you some extra um, seeping power so you'll, you'll get better drainage. So um, we do provide planting services. So if you guys don't want to dig a hole, um, I have three guys that will come out, um, plant anything that you want to uh, pick out. Uh, they'll plant it for you. We bring all the soil amendments that you're going to need. We do the first dose of fertilizer that you're going to need. And then uh, we do a root and growth treatment. Um, so we bring the mulch, the all-purpose fertilizer, and then the root and grow. Um, this root and grow, I do recommend when you purchase your plants to get another bottle because we recommend every two weeks for six weeks per time period to put this on, especially your woody stuff. I use it on my vegetables the first time just to kind of get them going, um, but after that, they're, they're fine. This is a two tablespoon or two ounces per um, gallon of water. So usually what we'll do is that last bucket is mixed in with this. Um, one of the most important things with planting trees is the staking. You definitely need to, if you're going to plant a tree, you want to stake it. And we do provide that. Um, the wind blows horribly. If you do not stake, you can have a crooked tree. Um, you want a tree to move a little bit because it creates a, a it, it gets a bigger, thicker trunk. Um, but you you don't want the root ball to move. If the root ball is moving, you're you're digging out your roots or pulling them out. Um, so. With our planting services, like I said, you get a two-year 50-50 warranty on your plant materials. So if anything happens to your trees or shrubs or, or uh, vines, uh, we go halves on the cost of the tree or shrub or vine, and um, the labor is free. Uh, that being said, if you guys work here for you, we want you to succeed. So if you have problems, take pictures of the issue um, bring them in. If you've got bugs, put them in a little baggie, bring them in. We have a microscope down in the uh, lower house that we can take a look at and we can figure out what's going on with the plant. Um, again, usually it's just that getting that watering issue correct. Um, and so you're putting the right amount of water for your area. Okay. Soil sulfur, um, because of our pH level is so very, very high, uh, we need to lower that pH level um, to make it more neutral. Um, there's two ways of doing that. Um, the all-purpose food, plant food, has sulfur in it, um, and that will help. We fertilize four, four times a year for evergreens three times a year for deciduous trees. Um, anything that's deciduous are, are things that are lo that lose their leaves in the winter time, um, that are sticks and just starting to green up right now. Um, evergreens need a four, uh, one extra one at New Year's. So we tell you to remember your holidays, um, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween, and New Year's Day. So, or if you're an accountant, you want to do it once a quarter. <laughs> it works that way too. Um, so soil sulfur also, if you are into your azaleas, your rhododendrons, camellias, all of those like very low acidity or low acid, so you want to add this to, to bring that pH down. 
Um, we are fixing to get into the bug season. Um, darn. Um, but um, aphids will start showing up here shortly, I'm sure. Uh, usually once leaves come out and your roses start getting really pretty, we start seeing the aphids. Um, so there are two things that will help alleviate aphids. Um, well, there's several things, but um, if you want to go naturally and you just have a small infestation, um, we do sell ladybugs. We just got them in uh, this, this afternoon. Um, so we do sell ladybugs in a container. Um, how to disperse ladybugs, it's kind of interesting. Um, we put them in a refrigerator, um, so we keep them cold. It kind of keeps them asleep, dormant, and then um, you take them home, keep them in a cool, uh, cool spot. At night, um, when the sun starts going down, you'll want to water your area uh, where your aphids are and then release them at that time um, because they'll kind of go to sleep. They'll, they'll burrow down where the uh, soil is wet. Um, and then in the morning they'll go up and they're, they're ready for breakfast just like us. Um, so that's kind of how you release the ladybug. Um, if you want to go the other way, um, we do have two products um, that are very, very similar. Um, this is the Triple Action Plus. So it has neem oil and the pyrethrin, um, which is a crushed chrysanthemum blend that uh, leaves a residue on our leaves that the aphids will start sucking on and then it'll kill them that way. Um, this also has neem oil in it um, that if you coat them, they'll suffocate that way as well. Um, this is our water's uh, multi-purpose insect control. This should be in, on your shelf um, for all uses. Um, I have one of these and one of these because this works pretty well in the springtime when it's not hot. Once it gets hot, this is like baby oil that we used to put on back in the day when sun tanning was really good for you. Um, but uh, it'll burn your plants and because of the intense sunshine that we have. Everybody should have two sprayers in, in their garage. Um, one for your uh, insect control and like your fungicide. The other one should be your weed uh, spray. You never want to put one in the other um, because if there's any residue in that weed spray and you put it on your beautiful rose, you're going to have issues. <laughs> um, so just mark it with a Sharpie um, and, and know which one's for which. Um, while I've got this in my hand, um, this is a Hudson self-mixing sprayer. This is a really cool spray bottle. Um, it's a hose-in sprayer, so it can get a good 20-foot uh, spray if you have the water pressure for it. Um, so you can get into the taller trees. Um, and, and it's easier to do than squirt, squirt, squirt. Um, these are kind of pricey, but it, if you clean it after you're done, you'll never have to buy another sprayer again. Um, there's actually a little knob up here that tells you you set it for the amount of product that you want to put on, and you just pour the product in here. It mixes itself, um, so whatever's left over, you can pour right in the bottle. You, it, you don't have to throw it away. So it's a great thing. We're going to talk about the boring stuff first, and then we'll get to the pretty stuff. Um, Revitalize is for fungal issues, uh, fire blight um, that can happen on apples, it can happen on pyracantha, uh, roses get a blight. Um, so there are a lot of different things can, that can get fire blight. Um, also for black spot, powdery mildew, all of those things that usually come on right before uh, the monsoon season, uh, it's always a good thing to have a, a fungicide in your arsenal at home. Yes. 
So we're fixing to get into full-blown annual season. Um, as you can tell, we're starting to bring in the, the warmer season flowers. Uh, most of what's up here can take a little bit of frost, um, but in a couple of weeks, the vincas and the, the angelini, uh, angelonia, uh, the moss rose, all of that hot summer weather annuals will be in. Um, hanging baskets will have all over the place. Um, flower power is our uh, fertilizer that we put put in a spray uh, a watering can, and you just water your plants. Uh, you put this on every two weeks. Um, it has this really really high middle number. So the first number when you are looking at a fertilizer is your nitrogen um, that for your leaves. Um, your second number is your flowers, and then your third is just kind of all around vigor for the plant. So um, that's kind of what that means. This has a 48 in the, the uh, phosphate, um, which is all about the bloom. So if you put this on every two weeks, you will keep your basket blooming all summer long. It's really important because those baskets, there's not a lot of soil in there, and by the time the summer's over, you won't even have any soil left in there. It'll just be a whole root ball. Um, so fertilizer's really important on those that just keep going. Um, also, if you've got roses um, that, or you have a, not that you're gonna have a party anytime soon, um, but if you have company coming or something like that, um, and you want to make your house look really pretty, put this on a couple of weeks before it's time and, and everything will start blooming um, that's supposed to. Um, I talked about watering. So kind of going back to the watering issue, um, you want to water very, very deeply less often is very important than a little bit every day or every other day. Um, the way the winds blow, if you, you're just watering that surface, you're basically wasting water because it's just sitting there drying up. Um, your plants are not getting it. So when you water, let it water very deeply. Um, know your drip system. Um, if you come in with yellowing leaves or a tree that's not doing well, one of the first questions we're going to ask is how much water is your tree getting? It's all about the volume. We need to know just how much water is actually going on that plant. Um, just saying it's a drip system doesn't mean nothing to me. You need to know what your emitters are. Um, usually they're etched on the side. Um, I would take a look at that and that'll help you make sure you're watering properly. Okay. Um, okay. Very good. All right, now to the pretty stuff. So I'm going to start with this big tree really quick, then I won't have to move too much stuff. This is one of our plants of the month uh, for the month of April. Um, this is a um, KV plum tree, purple leaf plum. Um, really pretty ornamental tree. He is going to get in that 20 foot tall range and about 20 wide. Um, kind of a giant lollipop shape. Um, he's really, really pretty because he does have the purple leaves and he'll keep that all summer long. And then he has the little, little pink flowers in the springtime. Um, and they usually will last for usually about a month, depending on whether we get the wind and the rain. Um, rain tends to wash flowers out really, really quickly. Um, but this is a really nice tree um, and a nice size for the smaller yards. We do have some smaller trees that you could definitely put in a pot. Um, there's some weeping redbuds uh, that only get six to eight feet tall. 
Um, and uh, so that would be a great one for a pot. Um, some of the fruit trees you could definitely put in a pot. Um, because of the, you can keep them trimmed, they won't, won't get so big and, and you can definitely keep them in a pot. I'm going to share this one too. Um, this is our all gold broom. Um, they bloom in the springtime. Um, they're a relative of the Spanish broom and uh, Scotch broom. Um, this one is a really nice size. He only gets four feet tall. He, so he doesn't get that eight foot where you have this massive tree that you have to trim up every year. Um, but he, he blooms and he smells really good. <laughs> this is a ballerina hawthorn. Um, this is one of our evergreens here. Um, he gets in that two to three foot tall range and about five wide. So he's a nice shrub to put like underneath the window, um, along the driveway and, you know, kind of in the back corner in a driveway. Um, they bloom in the springtime and then they have these nice dark uh, leaves in the winter. Um, and they keep their leaves. The hawthorns are deer resistant. Yes, absolutely. This is a honeysuckle, and this is the gold flame honeysuckle. And I love this guy um, because his flowers are so pretty. Um, we sell uh, uh, about five different varieties of honeysuckle. Unfortunately, this one is not evergreen, so he will lose his leaves and he'll just be a, sticks in the winter time. Um, but he has amazing flowers uh, and he's just gorgeous. Um, sometimes we do have the Hall's honeysuckle, and the Hall's honeysuckle is an evergreen parent. Um, and, and you see them around town. Um, some of them are upright, and some people just actually kind of chop them off and make a shrub out of them, um, and then just, or just let them on a hillside where you know you have the riprap and you just want some color there. Um, another thing people do um, is actually mix the two, so you have the flowers of this one, but you have the the green of the other one that can kind of intertwine with that. Columbine. Um, this one is uh, one of the songbird columbines that Ken's been talking about on the radio and in the newspaper. Um, they come in a variety of different colors. Um, the ones that we have right now are this pretty pink color. Um, they, they do come in blues and purples and yellows and all different colors. So um, this is a shade plant. Um, so he needs a little bit of afternoon shade. Um, blooms a couple times a year. So once they're done blooming, you can just kind of give them a haircut. Uh, they'll be just a nice green mound for you through most of the summer. And then usually mid-summer, they'll, they'll start living again for you. While I'm on shade plants, what I will talk about, um, and I'm going to massacre this num uh, name. But this is a, a dwarf Nico Dutza. And I'm probably mispronouncing that. But this is a small shrub. Um, again, it's a shade lover. Um, but it's just really pretty. It has these little delicate white flowers. Um, I'm going to get about two feet tall and about five feet wide. So it's a really nice brown cover-ish shrub. And again, it needs that afternoon shade. Mm -hmm. So Michelle, we have Heather 
has asked a couple of questions here. Absolutely. She'd like to know about when can you plant alyssum and does chicks and hens grow here and if so when can you plant them? Okay, uh, yes, the alyssum can be planted now. Uh, it can tolerate a little bit of cold. It is an annual, um, so feel free to put it in your, your pots with your uh, pansies, your petunias. Like I said, your petunias can take a little bit of cold as well. Um, hens and chicks, you can grow them here. Um, we have a bunch down in the lower house. Um, very easy to get started. Those are both full sun plants, so feel free to get started right away. Um, this guy is a Lithodoria. Um, really pretty blue. Um, there are very few plants that are truly blue, and this is one of them. Um, very, very pretty. Um, this is a ground cover, a shade ground cover. Um, so um, if it's planted properly, rock gardens, a shady rock garden, this would look beautiful in. Hey, Michelle. Bring that a little bit closer so they can see it on live stream. I can't go any closer zooming. Okay, That's good. Yeah, there later. you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Lithodoria. Any of these are like bee magnets? Uh, his question was is how many of these are bee magnets? And I would say 99.9% .9 of them are. Uh, basically anything that blooms. You're going to have these. Um, so if you are allergic, just put them out in the corner of your yard instead. This is one of my favorite shady plants. Um, this comes in a variety of different colors. Um, this one's the orange. It comes in dark purple. It comes in lime green. This is a hookera. Hoop, or coral bells, um, and this is all about the foliage. Um, it's just a spectacular color. It is a perennial, um, so it's going to stay this color from spring until once it comes up from the ground, it does go dormant in the wintertime, all summer long until the first frost. Once it freezes, it will die back to the ground. Sorry to interrupt you one more time, no, that's fine. but Ginger would like you to say the name of, I suspect it was the blue plant. Uh, she said the last. Okay, can you, and can you spell that so she Absolutely. can. Absolutely. L I T H O D O R A. And last shady plant that I have right now, I mean, we have a whole bunch here in the nursery. Uh, down in the lower section, uh, right as you come in the front door, that's kind of the shade perennial section. So down there, we have peonies, we have bleeding hearts, um, and a whole spread down there for you. Um, this one's a, a, an interesting one, and this is the first time I've seen this uh, here at this store. Um, this is called a fumewort. I don't like that name, uh, but it, actually it's called a cordalis. Um, really pretty, and this is another one that has a true blue color. Um, very delicate leaves, um, and, and it, it just blooms in the springtime. Okay, sorry to interrupt we one more time. Uh -huh. Ginger says, no, not the blue one, the one with the white flowers that was just before that. Okay. <laughs> the one I butchered, right? Yeah. Um, so it's Nico, N-I-K-K-O, and then D-U, or I'm sorry, D-E-U-T-Z-I-A. And I apologize that I butchered it. <laughs> okay, and before you get back on a roll again, Heather would like to know, um, let's see here, I'm, I'm having trouble reading this because of the <laughs> glare. Um, she, she would like to know what a few plants would be 
that would be good for a rock garden in full sun. Maybe you're going to cover that. It. Okay, yes. great. Hang on with me. Okay. All right, so for you rock garden people, um, we've got a couple here. So let's start with this one, because this one is very similar to the Lithodora. Um, this is the Candy Stripe Creeping Phlox. Um, he's going to be a green mound uh, all summer long, and then he blooms this pretty color in the springtime. Um, these actually come in a variety of different colors. So there's this candy stripe that's pink and white. Um, there's the red wing, which is a, a, a bright pink color. Um, there's also an emerald blue um, that is uh, kind of a lavender purple. Uh, but this is great for rock gardens. Um, gonna get about a foot and a half, two foot wide. Uh, nice. Uh, like I said, it, it looks like a green mound um, the rest of the year. Um, and it go grows everywhere because I actually saw it in Dewey the other day when I was driving through Quailwood. Um, somebody had a nice patch and it was in full bloom and it was absolutely gorgeous. <clears throat> this is our Iberius um, candy tuff. Um, this one as well is a mounded plant um, blooms in the spring and uh, will just be a green mound for the rest of the year um, but you can't beat this color it's also one of the companion plants it is for the one month. of the companion plants so, let me put companion plants together so this is one of my favorites um, this is a um, dianthus or carnation um, and these are actually evergreen um, so it's one of the few flowering plants that is evergreen um, I actually have one of these in a pot that's about this big and he's kind of my grass <laughs> I just pretend he's my grass um, but um, beautiful flowers um, come in a variety of colors uh, this guy is the cherry pie. Um, we have one that's um, pink and white, um, and which is called Pinball Wizard, I believe. And then there's red, um, there's an orange one down there right now, and then there's a purple one as well. Um, again, they're all evergreen. They'll look like this for the rest of the season. And again, I used my flower power on this every two weeks, and he'll bloom all summer long. Once his flowers just kind of die off, just go through and deadhead them, get rid of it, and, and they'll just keep blooming. Okay, so this one, anybody that knows me, I, I recommend this one often. Um, this is an autumn sage. Uh, variety of different colors variety of sizes so most of them are going to stay in that two to three foot uh, size range um, they have nice bright green leaves gorgeous flowers um, this one is the heat wave red or radio red um, there are pinks purples um, corals whites so any color to fit any garden scheme that you guys have um, Hummingbirds love this guy. So if you want to draw in hummingbirds, this is the plant for you. Um, they bloom all summer long from April to November. Continuous blooms. Um, need a little bit of deadheading a little bit just to keep them going. But other than that, they're, they're pretty low maintenance. In the springtime or early winter, January, February, you're just going to give them a haircut, cut them back, and then they'll come up from there. Um, this is another uh, plant that I love. Uh, this is a perennial. Uh, it's called Scabiosa, or pincushion flower. Um, butterflies love this guy. 
um, because he has a nice little landing pad for them to hang out. Um, in the uh, August, uh, early fall, um, we have butterflies like crazy down in the lower house, it, and they're all over these um, really pretty plants. Again, just deadheading them, keeps them blooming over and over again. These plants to here are also pretty good for uh, rock gardens as well because they, they kind of keep that clumping form. Um, this is a sage, uh, very, oh, back to the autumn sage. He is also deer animal resistant um, because he's part of the sage family. Um, anything that has an odor uh, is going to be resistant to animals. And I say that loosely because sometimes if they get hungry, they will eat. But um, typically they stay away from all the sages and such. Um, this is the uh, meadow sage. Um, he's going to get about this tall with the nice green leaves. And then the flowers just kind of come up from there. Um, these guys come in the purples, the pinks, and the whites. So he's also a very pretty uh, plant to put in a rock garden next to a big boulder really pretty. These two actually bring some yellow to your garden. Um, these are tick seed um, or coreopsis. Um, this one is just a plain puffball. Um, he is called uh, the golden spear, um, appropriately named. Um, Deadheading is kind of one of those things if you were a gardener, you kind of want to do. Um, it gets you closer to your plants. You can kind of keep an eye on what's going on. Also helps you identify if you have bug issues or fungal issues and stuff like that. Um, we're, we're all gardeners. We just need to pay attention to what the plants are telling us. Um, this one's called uh, Uptick Yellow Red. So he's kind of a daisy-like flower that has the, the red eye, um, or red center, and then the yellow eye. Um, again, nice shrubby plant, brown cover, keeps low. This here also is a plant that, if you have critters, is a good one to put out there. Um, this is an allium. Um, it's also called Society Garlic. Um, it does smell like garlic, uh, but it has really, really pretty flowers. So it's a nice um, addition to your yard. Um, you can keep it in front because of the flowers are kind of wispy and you can see through them. So you could put something taller in the back. Let's talk about herbs real quick. Um, herbs, um, most of our herbs are cold hardy here. Um, they will last through most of the winter. Sometimes lavenders do die back a little bit. Just give them a haircut and uh, fertilize. They should come back uh, for you. Um, lavenders are very, very drought tolerant. Um, so watch your water with them. They don't like to be wet. Um, this one is a Spanish lavender. Um, we actually, earlier in the season, we had a, we have this dark purple. There's a pink one, and then there's a white one that has the purple inside, so, which is really, really pretty. Um, there's also English lavender. We have the French lavender, so we have all different varieties of lavender. Um, Hidcoat and Munstead are mo probably the most hardy varieties that we sell. So if you're in an area like River Creek, where it's a little bit higher altitude, those are probably better for you. This is Pink Chips uh, Thyme. It's a creeping thyme. So for those of you that kind of want that green grass look, this is a perfect place to put, you could put this in a little patch in your decomposed granite or your gravel that you have. 
just kind of scrape back the rocks, plant this guy, he'll get a good three feet. Um, uh, Ken used to have a house over here that was covered with this stuff until the dogs got to it. Um, or it got not taken care of. Um, but um, the, the um, dogs can roll in this, you can walk on it, and it won't hurt it. Um, it's uh, pink chintz, woolly thyme, or pink chintz, creeping thyme. Um, and it has little pink flowers also. Um, but you can also cook with it if you want to. Um, there are more edible times over there, um, but this is a great ground cover if you want to add some uh, green. It does kind of die back in the winter time, um, but it will come back. talking about sages earlier and I just wanted to isn't that pretty um, these are four different varieties of sage um, we have the uh, this is purple sage and then this is the golden sage right here um, this is your basic uh, burn garden sage and then this is the tricolor sage but wouldn't that be pretty in a pot <laughs> And then this guy here is curry. Um, and I, I like this guy just because of the color. Um, you can cook with it. Um, he also, for, for like annual pots, um, he can provide that silvery um, base for you, um, kind of like Dusty Miller or something like that. Um, gives you a little bit of texture in your pots. Lastly, this is another companion plant. Um, this is a little guy. Uh, this lilac is Miss Kim. Um, he is uh, one of our kind of mid-size lilacs that, uh, that we have. Uh, he'll get about four foot tall. Um, blooms only once, unfortunately. Um, but he smells really good. Um, nice shrub. Um, deciduous so they do lose their leaves and uh, but it, it'll smell like grandma's house <laughs> okay. I think I have talked about everything that I wanted to talk about do you guys have any questions for me really <laughs> okay so the, the two sages I, like you suggested to us for the front yard, mm -hmm. that, that would work out there. Absolutely, and you they betcha. Are, and they stay during the winter too then? Absolutely. Sorry. These guys here? No, 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 the, the, the color. This, this one. one. Yeah. Okay, so this is autumn sage and it won't, it does not, depending on our winter, it does not usually stay green. Okay. Uh, usually it dies back and then you just kind of give it a, a quick little haircut. Okay. Um, but it does bloom for, for all summer long, a okay. long period of time. Okay. And it would work perfect for your yard. When do you get a haircut? Uh, in the sp early spring, uh, so February-ish. February. Yeah. So pruning here, um, we, we don't do it in the fall. If you need to clean stuff up, kind of, you can give it a, a quick whack. Um, but usually, December, January are our oldest periods of the year. Um, so if you whack too much back, you might get some more frost, so you might lose some more. So clean your areas up and then um, kind of do your hard pruning in the spring, February-ish. Okay. Well, if no one has any questions, I guess we'll wrap this up. I'll be around if you guys have something you want to talk to me about later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.